Uh, it is, however, though, a, a somber anniversary in this country. A year ago today, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. Our lives were turned upside down. Businesses and schools closed. Thousands of Canadians were laid off. Everyone was told to stay home while the virus spread across the country. Since the first case was detected in Canada, there have been 896,000 more. Over 22,000 people have died from the virus. To commemorate the victims, the federal government has declared March 11th, today, a national day of observance. Patty Haidu is the Minister of Health. She's with us from Thunder Bay, Ontario. Hi, Minister Haidu. Good to see you. Thank you very much for making time tonight. Thanks for having me, Vashi. I know that we're all spending today kind of looking back on the year that was, but I actually wanted to start off with you kind of looking ahead. And, and from your perspective, how different you think the conversation might be a year from now? And more specifically, do you think normal life will have returned? Oh, this is the, the famous silver ball or silver, uh, you know, crystal ball kind of question. Listen, I think we're we're definitely in a better place than we were a year ago and really solely because of the vaccines and the research around coronavirus, knowing more about how it transmits and how we can protect ourselves and measures that, you know, businesses can take and individuals can take. So we know so much more. And I think as we proceed along vaccination and the world proceeds along vaccination, I think we will be having a very different conversation in here. Do you think vaccination is the key to a return to normal life? And, and by that specifically, I mean, if, if we are all vaccinated, that we should be able to lead, lead lives that are restriction, restriction free. Listen, I think it's a really important, powerful tool. Absolutely. And I think that what we know about vaccination right now is that it absolutely saves lives. And, and we're starting to see that data from uh, Canadian evidence as well with long term care vaccinations well underway and and, uh, you know, seeing a significant decline in the number of infections and deaths in long term care. The question that uh, scientists remind me is still unanswered is the transmissibility of COVID-19. Even if you are vaccinated, we know that people who are vaccinated can get mild cases of COVID-19. Um, are they still as infectious as they were prior to vaccination? That's the research that remains. But yes, that's the goal. The goal is that the more of us that are vaccinated and the more protection we have, the more quickly we can return to uh, a normal life. Is it fair to say until the data is more conclusive on transmissions and vaccines, it, it, you won't be able to pronounce whether or not, let's say, we won't have to wear masks even if we are all vaccinated? Or can you pronounce that now? I would not be comfortable making any kinds of guesses around uh, evidence that's not there yet or research that's still evolving. But what I can say is that vaccination has been an incredibly powerful tool with other infectious diseases. So we have history to draw on where we've seen vaccination reduce the risk of illness and death in many other kinds of countries and situations and diseases. So there's you know, a good bet that vaccination is going to allow us back uh, to get to get our lives back to some degree of, of normalcy. Uh, the question is how quickly and, uh, you know, I think it's a cautious approach that needs to be taken right now so that we can continue to protect lives and we can continue to uh, reduce the, the, the number of people that are getting sick. Do you worry at all, though, without the ability to say life will return to normal when we're all vaccinated conclusively? It might, uh, it might lead to more fatigue. It might lead to uh, more hesitancy where vaccines are concerned. I, you know, I, I, I worry about all of that, Vashi. I worry about people's fatigue and impatience and, and their, their, their psychological distress. Listen, people have sacrificed enormously for a year, whether it's personal sacrifice uh, in terms of their their careers, their earnings, their small businesses, their families, not seeing their families, um, you know, moms working, uh, dads working while trying to educate their kids at home and the list goes on. So I do worry that people are tired and they're going to throw up their hands and say, well, when will it be over? But what I do know is that the evidence is promising and we know vaccines are saving lives. We also know that even in countries with great vaccination programs underway, that there are are still infections occurring. And what we don't want to see is an uncontrolled surge in any part of the country that leads to loss of life. I want to ask you, Minister, about some of the policies your government has pursued over the last year, and, and in particular one that it recently put into effect, and that is around the borders. 
a year ago, or, or travel and the borders, a year ago, I remember so clearly you telling me that the virus doesn't know borders, that closing them down won't be effective in controlling the spread of the virus. Now, uh, thanks to, for example, the hotel quarantine policy and the testing before you land, when you land, uh, that, that your government has employed, and, and something that the prime minister says is some of the strictest measures at the border around the world, uh, that policy in particular, the hotel quarantine, I know you were at committee taking questions over it. There have been a lot of issues with it. We've heard specifically from people who had uh, trouble with n there not being locks on the doors. Uh, there are allegations of sexual assault. There are people who were traveling for funerals and couldn't secure an exemption. What evidence do you have that this policy will work? Mm. Well, first of all, I'll just say in regards to borders, we've been adding layers of protection since the beginning of the detection of the virus in Wuhan oh so long ago. And, uh, you know, recently with the uh, the emergence of variants of concern, in particular the one that originated in the UK, of course, we needed to respond and we needed to be able to understand how the virus was changing and, and mutating and whether or not that would pose additional risks to Canadians. And so this approach is really to uh, ensure that people have a place to isolate while they receive their their test, uh, their um, PCR test that is mandatory upon arrival. And it allows for us to actually take those uh, samples and analyze them for variants of concern so that we can have evidence about what kinds of virus changes the, the world is seeing and indeed are being imported into Canada. Again, respectfully, though, that doesn't answer whether or not there's evidence to support that is an effective policy. I mean, more effective, for example, than the policies you already had in place, which involved taking that test uh, before you got on the plane, after you landed, and then quarantining uh, for two weeks at home. Well, listen, I think it, what what it's very effective at is allowing us for to have direct access to the samples, because, of course, prior to this, if people were tested a, in a provincial setting, there was no guarantee that we would be able to track those samples and test them. And what we uh, what we know is that as the virus changes and mutates, it does present risk in terms of the progress that we've all made in uh, defeating the virus, in particular around the vaccines and the effectiveness of the vaccines. That's why this step is so critical in in terms of, you know, evidence to support the, the, the direction, well, the evidence is that we do have the emergence of variants of concerns, and we've always followed the advice of uh, public health experts and scientists and researchers. Policy is, uh, in Canada is dependent on that advice, and that's exactly what we've done. So I'm just a little bit confused. Was the policy pursued so that you could have direct access to samples for, for variant testing? Because that's certainly not the way that your government characterized it initially. Certainly, the policy is in place for a variety of reasons. One, to reduce the importation of COVID-19 into Canada during a very critical time, as I said, where we're pursuing vaccination and where we know that uh, to get people protected is one of the best ways to, pr to protect against one of these variants of concern taking hold. Secondly, as I said, to be able to test those any of those positive samples for variants of concern and to watch as the virus shifts and, and mutates and to understand what that looking like both uh, from from a perspective of uh, the ones that we know about and the ones that potentially we don't know about. And so uh, this is very, I think, important work, especially given the critical junction that juncture that we're at now. If the goal is to limit entry of variant cases, do you know, again, is there evidence to show that adding that layer of the hotel quarantine is more effective than uh, what the measures that were already in place around testing and, and home quarantine. And I, I'm asking specifically, I understand the need to do everything possible to limit the entry of those variants and the spread of it. But like I said, there are some pretty harrowing stories of what people are going through during this. There are a lot of bumps in the road. Why not suspend the program, for example, until you can provide Canadians with the evidence that it is absolutely necessary? Well, um, listen, I've heard those stories too, and we've worked incredibly hard to ensure that the process is far smoother for travelers. And in fact, it is. Uh, wait times are down significantly to get through the line. Uh, people can book online. In fact, most travelers are booking their hotel rooms before they're arriving. And so things are, are far smoother. And so I thank Canadians for their patience. But this is a very important part of our protection at the, at the border of understanding, again, um, how 
many people are coming across the border. Listen, the data set uh, internationally is incomplete. And I think countries around the world are struggling with how best to protect against importation while having the least impact on international travel. We've reminded Canadians, though, over and over, this is not the time to travel. And of course, it is difficult. It's difficult to travel right now to many, if not most countries. And that's because countries, as I said, globally are trying to figure out the right blend of measures at their borders. Would you admit now, a year later, the virus does know borders? Well, I think the story is still being told on COVID-19, and I'm looking forward to those analyses about what measures are most effective. We started, as you know, with screening and with asking people to quarantine uh, from very directly affected countries. Uh, some countries shut their borders and had extreme surges in, in cases, and so I think that's the work that will be done. Certainly, it's been helpful for us in terms of reducing the numbers of importation, uh, but I, I will leave that question to the scientists who undoubtedly will be reflecting on all of these lessons and providing advice to the government of Canada for future disease control at borders. But from your own perspective, do you regret being so emphatic that that was that the opposite was true a year ago? If you had been more open to the possibility, do you think those measures that you're listing off now could have come into effect earlier and could have, in fact, uh, prevented earlier spread of the virus? You know, everything that I said in the media a year ago was direct advice from the experts and the scientists that were advising the government of Canada. And of course, uh, as things changed and shifted and as uh, it became clear that we had a global pandemic that some countries did not even realize that they had the virus within their uh, within their own countries, of course, that advice changed. And I am proud of a country that believes in following evidence and science. And certainly that's what I've done as the health minister throughout this past year. Okay, Minister, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you very much, Fashi. That's Patty, Patty Hadu, rather. She's the federal health minister. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.